Oh, come on, y'all can do better than that. How y'all doing today? Awesome, awesome. Now, uh, I know I don't look like Dustin, uh, even though we look very much similar. Uh, he is out of town with family, and I am here today in his stead. So first, I want to thank God for bringing me here, uh, just meeting. The way we met in college, you haven't heard the story, it's pretty remarkable. And we kind of been friends since we saw each other, like literally saw each other. It was kind of like this weird connection. So first, I want to thank God for allowing me to be here in front of you all, and then I want to thank him for entrusting me uh, to handle the word in front of y'all, uh, my wife who's out of town, and my family and friends that are here. So just, you know, get all those plenaries out the way. But I hope y'all are ready for a word from God. I mean, people are ready for a word from God. Now, I see y'all been in this series called Fresh Start. I'll be watching online. Um, recently retired from my other church. So I said, I'm going to come out here and help you and just sit and just learn, man. Like, just sit with God and, and just, and, it's, and then the first thing he says, well, how about you preach on May the 15th? I was like, oh, God, and I, and I kind of end up doing it now, as you see. Um, so, yes, let's continue that series, Fresh Start. Let's continue to talk about what God is doing in your life, what may be doing in life. And I don't know about you, but I'm always looking forward to God doing something new in my life. I never want to get to a point in my life where I'm just like, yeah, keep doing the old thing. Matter of fact, if you're in a relationship, most reasons why relationships die because you don't want to do something new. I don't know who I'm helping this morning, but take that and do something new when you, like, don't go to the, the Golden Corral, go to the Longhorn, I don't know, after church, do something different. All right, turn with me to the book of Ruth, Ruth, Ruth. Now, um, contrary to popular belief, um, when we look at this text in Ruth, Ruth is very interesting, and especially when you're looking at the Old Testament, it is a very interesting text, because Ruth is not a Hebrew woman. Ruth was not a Jew. She's a Moabite woman, but yet she finds herself with a book named after her in the Old Testament, surrounded by Jews and Hebrew men, mostly. And that always just shows how special and God and unique God is and how he's looking for anybody who's willing to do something for him. And, and I think he hasn't changed. I think he hasn't stopped looking for people who love him and who want to do something new. May I read it? Now, I normally don't do this, but I'm going to jump around in this book because I couldn't just take out one part. I want you to see Ruth's life. I want you to go on a journey with me in the text, okay? And I, when you leave here today, I want, I want you to be able to say, man, that lady Ruth, yeah, I like her. Or I never knew Ruth was in the Bible. And then you learn something. I hope that's my goal today, but I do want you to see this. So we're going to start at chapter one, and we're going to make our way to chapter four. I'm not going to read all the chapters, so you're okay. I'm going to jump around. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and his two sons, went to live for a, in another country of Moab for a while. The man's name was Imelech, and his wife's name was Naomi. And the, son, and the name of their two sons were Molin and Kilion. They were Ephraites from Bethlehem in Judah. And they went to Moab to live there. Verse 3. Now Imelech, Naomi's husband, died. And she was left there with her two sons. They married Moabite women. One name was Orpah. I know that looks like Oprah, but it's Orpah. And the other was Ruth. And they lived there about 10 years. Both Malon and Kilon also died. And Naomi was left without her two sons and husband. We're going to jump down to verse 18. If you're using, you know, your Bible, it's just easy to scroll up if you're using your phone. When Naomi, verse 18, when Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. Verse 19, so the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. When they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women exclaimed, can this be Naomi? Don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life bitter. I went away Fool, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Wow. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. All right, turn with me to chapter 4. It's going to get very interesting here. Verse 9. Give you a second. Chapter 4, verse 9. Then Boaz announced to the elders, all the people today you are witnessing, or you have witnessed that I've bought from Naomi all the property of Imelech, Kilon, and Melon, I have also acquired Ruth the Moabite, 
Mulan's wife as my wife in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property so that the name would not disappear from among his family or his hometown. Today, you are a witness. Dear Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for this opportunity. Open the hearts and the mind of your people. Open my hearts and my mind as well. God, use me as a lightning rod to show your goodness, to show how things, you're trying to do something new in us, to show how you're cultivating us and you're making us new every day. We simply got to choose you. God, open us up so that we can hear from you and change this world. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, the title of my sermon is, It's Not How It Starts, But It's How It Finishes. I know you probably heard that phrase before, but it's not how it starts, it's how it finishes. Now, um, my granddad is here, and we're probably going to go bowling after I get through preaching, and I am terrified a little bit because I am rusty, A, but my granddad is a really good bowler, a bowler. And I will never forget this moment we went out on Friday night. And it was me, my uncle, and I was on fire. I was laser. Now, now you got to understand, I've been bowling with my granddad since I was like 9 or 10 years old, maybe even before that. And he's been whooping my butt <laughs> since I existed, pretty much. And this one night, this one Friday night, I am just, I can just see it. The ball is dropping right where it's supposed to drop. And I'm just getting, spit, I mean, strike after strike after strike. And one through nine. All strikes. Now, he's, he, he's, he's not doing bad. He got some strikes and some spares. But I, in my head, I am literally three strikes from a 300. And, I, and I'm nervous now. I'm sitting down. I'm, I have this laser focus. I'm not laughing anymore. I'm, I'm just, you know how you, you get serious about something because you know you're about to do something that's almost impossible. If you never rolled a three, most people in this room have never rolled a 300 because it's hard to do. And I'm sitting there, and I'm like, it's time. Not only am I about to roll a 300, but I'm about to spank him in the process. Can it get any better than this? So I'm focused. Because how I started was strong. But now it came down to three strikes. Get up. I'm excited. I roll. And the ball does the same thing it's been doing all night. Except this time, I get a 7-10 split. And I'm like, oh, my God. And my heart is beating. I'm now trying to calculate the score to see, will I still win? Will, will I still beat my granddad? And then I go down there, and I cannot, I just, I just blow it, y'all. <laughs> just, I miss all the 7 10 splits, and I'm not like, oh, man, now I'm done. And all I hear is laughter in the background. As I turn around from rolling, my granddad is, is polishing his ball. He's got his powder on. He's doing all this extra stuff, he's, and he's laughing because he knows how to count the score. And he says, Man, you started strong, but you ain't finished. And he said that, and he said, and I'm calculating the score, and I'm just, my math is bad. Bowling math is hard, okay? And then regular math is hard, but bowling math, oh, my God. It's a good thing that's not a subject, okay? And, 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 and he goes up, and he, you know, does this thing, gets three strikes in a row. And he beats me by, like, five pins. My heart. <laughs> now, we got, we got, like, five more games left, and my heart is just sunk. Because I'm like, yo, like, I had this game. This is, this, is, this is me. And my granddad is laughing, and he goes on his tradition to whip me the next four or five games we play. But I was hung up on that game because sometimes I feel like many of us in our life, we start off so strong, especially as Christians, as believers. You remember the first time you got saved? Oh, my God, you wanted to tell everybody about Jesus. You was that Jesus freak. You was that annoying Christian. You was like, oh, here they come. They about to say something about Jesus. Yes, he's, Jesus is highly favored. Praise his name. Hallelujah. You was doing laps. You was praying for everybody. You had your wall of scriptures, and you were so excited. But then what happened on a journey is life happens, and your excitement goes down, and it just doesn't feel the same. Like me at Bowen, everything was good until it got to this this climactic moment, this moment where it was time for me to show myself and show what God can do for me. in bowling, I was like, it should have been God that got the strikes. I know he would have did it. But it, it was all about me, and life changed in an instant. I wonder how many, of us, how many of us have been affected by that. Come on, think about it. Look at your life. The marriage started off good. They, they have phrases for it. The honeymoon stage. What are they saying when they say that? Oh, y'all just love each other a lot? And it's just bliss. No, they're saying it's going to be a time when something will change and you're going to have to ask some real questions. Some of y'all already know what I'm talking about. You, you don't look at your spouse. 
at 2 o'clock in the morning as they're snoring. And you're like, I can just put the pillow here and leave it gently. I'm not trying to kill them. But if they happen to die, I mean, God, is that your will be done. Some of us have, have got to a job where they're paying more and we're so excited and the atmosphere and the environment is so right. But then month five and six hit and you see that supervisor isn't that cool. Some of your uh, co-workers are just a little irritable. It takes a long time to get there. The commute is bad and the job changes. And we really look at our lives and we compare ourselves to Ruth, then we see an interesting contrast. Because if we leave stuff at where it starts, most time for many of us is good, but for some of us, that's not our testimony. Some of us grew up in homes where dad wasn't there, maybe mom wasn't there. Some of us grew up in homes where we didn't have a lot of money. You had to figure stuff out. That's why we have stuff like goulash. And those people who laugh, you know what goulash is. It's whatever you found, you just put it in a pot and you're stirring it and you're praying for a good outcome. Some of us have been there when the pack of uh, ramen noodles we had to share, and we were looking at each other like, how, how do we tell if it's even? <laughs> some of us remember those days when the lights would get cut off, and, and some of us are like, that never happened. God bless you. That's good. But some of us, our lives didn't start off like good. And that leads me to look at Ruth's life and how it starts. But it, but it didn't finish how it started. And the first point that I have for you today, family, is this. Devastation does happen in a family. So devastation in the family, that's what I see immediately. If you read chapter 1, they give you no time to enjoy Naomi. They give you no time to enjoy their marriage. They start killing the folks in Ruth immediately. The first thing you start with is a famine. Now, if you don't, like, like, like the, I mean, if you don't believe me, it says in the days the, uh, the judges ruled, there was a famine. It's nothing good. That's the first verse. And then watch this. What you see is, if, I don't know, when I was studying that word famine, it just, I just got hung up on it. And when you look at a famine, we most times think there's just no food. No, 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 no. No, it's not like us. Like, if we was going to famine today, it's nothing at the grocery store. Like, okay, we'll, we'll, we got stuff, and we'll make it work. Like, eventually there will be food in the grocery store. We'll go. When they say no famine, what they're meaning, there's no rain, there's no crops, there's no harvest, there's no food, it's hot, they're bothered, there is nothing for anyone or any animal. So bad that they had to move away. That's crazy. That's how the story starts. And then we don't get to enjoy Imelech at all because in verse 3, he dies. And they don't even tell us why. This is like, it's, whoever wrote this was like in a very dark place, okay? It's like famine, Imelech is dead. <laughs> wait, wait, what? And Imelech dies, so Naomi is a widower, and, but she's still kind of surviving. Many of us have lost people, lost spouses, lost, you know, people, and you, you, you don't really get over it. You just learn to live with it. So, so Naomi just probably grasping the fact that she lost her husband, which means she lost money, which means she lost some rights, because you got to remember, we're in a different time frame. And then she loses her two sons. Ten years later, that is no time. And she's looking now at her sons and her husband gone, and all she's left with were two dollar-in-laws. Now, the first time she says to them, hey, y'all can go, 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 because by, by the time I have kids, you, they get 18 or whatever the age is to marry, they're not going to like you. <laughs> You're going to be, she says this, this is in the Bible. She says, they're not going to like y'all. Y'all going to be old with me. So it doesn't matter. Just go do your thing and remarry. You have time. Trust me. Naomi was like, I don't have time, but you have time. And Orpah's like, and both of them in the beginning, it's like, no, we're going to stay with you. Now, why they said this, I have no idea. But Naomi insisted. She's like, no, you go. Go. I'm telling y'all, it's going to be bad with me. Go. As you can see, things are bad for me. Get away from me. And, of course, Oprah's like, okay, I don't want to leave, but I got to go. <laughs> Ruth does not leave. Ruth stays. And, then, I, and until this, I, I'm telling you, I read this thing back and forth, and I, could, I have no idea why Ruth stays. It had, in my imaginary biblical mind, is maybe things were so bad for Ruth before but this is, like, if this, I mean, it had to get better for her. Because I was like, there's no way you have a famine and death, and you think, yeah, I want to hang out with you more. <laughs> Come on, somebody came to you and said, hey, everybody dies around me. I was like this. <laughs> I thought we were going to be friends, but I'm cool. <laughs> Naomi tells Ruth, get away from me. Go do your thing. She refuses. And I wish I could say that, like, once you got saved, that all the devastation in your life will just stop. 
I've been a Christian for a long time, and trust me, I've experienced some devastation. I lost my dad at 17. I didn't get some promotions I was supposed to get. I, my GPA didn't stay where it, was supposed to get, where it was supposed to stay in college. I lost some hope scholarship. I've seen some stuff. Then I'm like, God, if you don't show up here, I will be devastated. I am devastated. God, help me. And I don't know what about it in your life, why, 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 why Christians tend to think, to ride that oftentimes that when we start seeing devastation, that God doesn't love us anymore. If you don't believe me, look what Naomi says. When she goes back to Bethlehem, she says, hey, don't call me Naomi no more. Call me Mara. Call me Mara. Because God has stripped everything away from me, and I'm bitter. And I'm, and, 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 and I'm like, how do you still, I get why you feel like that. I, I see the devastation in your life, but God, you're still, you're still here. And for some, for some other reason, this other lady keeps hanging around you too. You have people. The great thing about it, in her devastation, Naomi tried to identify with it. She tried to give herself a new name to match her devastation. And I would like to encourage you that when you're going through stuff, don't make that stuff your identity. Yes, you got a divorce, but you're not a divorce A. You're just not with that person anymore. Many times people walk around and say, oh, I'm divorced. Oh, I'm a widow. Oh, I'm this. No, stop putting power to that devastation and says, no, God is working something new in me. Okay, 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 okay. Okay, so, so, so for some of us, for some of us, you know, it's a saying that says, hey, no storm lasts forever, right? The rain, you know, you got these catchy, you know, rain phrases. And, and, and it's true, but some of us in our lives, it feels like we've been stuck in a Category 5 hurricane, and it feels like it's not in it anytime soon. Naomi wanted a name change because she identified with her grief. You can see it presently, but she couldn't see the end. The good thing I like about the biblical text here is in Ruth that nobody ever calls her Mara. No, nobody. They just call her Naomi. It's like, it's almost as if they was like, we don't care about all that. You're Naomi. <laughs> we don't care. It's almost like the people around her was like, you're Naomi. You're, you're, you're good. Like, it's like they could see the end. And you need to have some people around you that when you're in devastation, they're not identifying your situation. It's like, no, 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 I'm going to push you through this. This is not where you're going to end. This is not where you're going to die. You're going to experience devastation in your family. Whatever the kid acting up, whatever your spouse acting up, maybe the dog going crazy and the fish keep jumping out the bowl. I don't know. But you will have devastation in your family. The objective of devastation would lead me to point number two is to keep moving. And point number two is you got to have some determination for your family. you got to have some determination for your family. Uh, uh, um, it's it's, it's, it's a, a movie that I really, really like. Really, really like. That's not my favorite movie, okay, but it's a line I really, really like. It's called Finding Nemo. Now, one of the, in this movie, that, that this, I'm telling you, Disney and Pixar make some life-changing movies. They're not for kids. I don't know if I'm going to let my daughter watch them. I have no idea what she's going to watch. Probably a lot of Veggie Tales. Because the, the stuff in here are just revolutionary. And if you've never seen Finding Nemo, go home with your family, do something different, and watch Finding Nemo. It will bless you, and you will feel saved beyond recognition. Trust me. But it's a scene in Finding Nemo that blows my mind every time I watch it. Like, I, I watch that scene and rewind and like, what in the world? Did they squeeze this little nugget here? And it's when Nemo, this little fish, you know, get, he disobeys his dad. He's venturing out, gets lost. And then he's got to find his way. His dad's looking for him. He, he's trying to find his way back home. He can't because the ocean is big. We know that. And he bumps into this fish named Dory. Now, Dory's a very interesting character fish here because she can't remember anything. She has amnesia. And I was like, for them to introduce a fish with amnesia is what? You know, like, fish can have amnesia too? Like, my brain was like broke for a second. I'm like, no, fish can, 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 God, can a fish have amnesia? Can you tell me? Anyway, sorry, I got sidetracked there. Watch this. In the dialogue, things started to get really tough for Nemo. And Dory says, I don't know, because she forgets. And then she says, we just got to keep swimming. We just got to gotta keep, just got to keep swimming. And I was like, what? Nemo is in the middle of his devastation when he knows and learns that he probably will never make it home again. He's now separated from his father. He's in this foreign place. He's meeting some rough fish. I'm going to say cats, but fish. And, and, and he's like, I don't know anymore. And Dory says, just keep swimming. 
We got to have the same type of determination that Ruth was, was I'm not leaving you, Naomi, in your darkness. I'm just going to keep walking with you. I'm going to keep talking with you. I'm going to keep trusting you. I'm just going to keep swimming. Everything that Naomi tells Ruth, Ruth does obediently because she was determined to stay by Naomi. It got me thinking about our relationship with Christ. When we're in the middle of our devastation, are we determined to get out or are we determined to stay put? What bothers me, I read this scripture and I love this, uh, 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 Psalm 23, it says, Though I walk through the valley of the shadow, though I walk through. And people miss that word, walk and then through. Because a lot of times we're not walking through our valleys. We, we have made camp. We have made a village, a city in the valley. And God is like, you're not supposed to be here. But many of us are not determined to keep moving. I don't know about you. I'm, I'm a fan of basketball. I like basketball. I watched uh, uh, the game Friday night with the Warriors in uh, Memphis. Now, I am, a, I, I, I am old school a little bit. I don't like when young players get really hyped good. I'm, I'm, I'm biased. I like when you prove that you're good, stay good about five or six years, then you have my approval. So as I see this young Memphis Grizzly team just knock down threes and shot, and they keep making the game, they were supposed to just roll over and just die, like, already, like, lose the game so we can go to the next series. Eventually, the whole game is closed. I don't know if you watched it. The whole game was closed. I am up and nervous because I'm like, oh, my gosh, they may actually tie this series to Golden State. And I'm nervous. I, don't, I'm not, I haven't bet on a game or anything weird like that. I just want to see them lose, okay? And eventually, I don't know what, it's almost like somebody hit a switch in fourth minute, the fourth quarter, like two minutes left to go, Stephen Cur Steph, Steph Curry, Clay Thompson, it's like they just said, it's championship time. And they just, bam, 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 three, three, and shot. I was like, oh, yes, yes. I'm, you know, I got a baby. Yes. Yes. And the game was over. And I was happy. My blood pressure was back to regular. I didn't have to go to the hospital. And then they showed a clip of uh, 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 Steph Curry. And he's like, yes. You know, he's, he's excited. they going to the Western Conference Finals. And he says, you got to keep shooting. No matter how many times you miss, you got to keep shooting. You got to keep shooting. Yeah. And goes off. And God says, why don't my people do that? I see the game is close. I see you go down by some points. I see it keeps going back and forth. I know life feels like a roller coaster, up, then, down, up. But you got to keep shooting. But what are we shooting with? We're shooting with our prayer. We're shooting with our fasting. We're shooting with our time with God. We're, we're, we're shooting shots. When we connect ourselves to our spiritually father, how many of us are determined to have at least five minutes with God? Five minutes. We spend more time in the bathroom than that. And half of that time we'd be on the phone. How many people are being honest? You know, you don't even use in the bathroom. You're just scrolling like, oh, stop. I've been here for 30 minutes. My bad. Like, yes, other people had to use the bathroom. Watch this. We can't even, we have believers who can't give God five minutes in prayer. Reminds me of Jesus. When Jesus says, can't y'all just stay up with me a little while? Peter like this, what? <laughs> I'm tired. And many of us, we have to have some type of determinist, uh, to determined mentality in us to say, hey, I got to keep going. I got to keep pushing. It doesn't end here for my family. I'm going to carry the family name further. I'm going to do something great for my family. It has to start with me. How many people are determined to see what God does in your life? Like Paul says in Philippians uh, 3.14, he says, we must press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. In your devastation, you must continue to trust God. I know it's bad. I know you feel alone. I know you feel depressed. I know those feelings. Been there. Not a t-shirt, trust me. But I, I, I couldn't stay there. I had to make different choices. I got to fast a little bit longer. I got to fast a little bit different. I got to read a little bit harder. I got to pray a little bit longer. I want my family to look different. I want God to say, if I happen to die and today and something, God, please don't. But if I happen to die today, and I want God to say, you did well by your family. Yeah. So in order for me to do that, I have to do something different. Because I can't have it in worse off than it started. Point number three. I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna leave, I'm about to get out of y'all way. I think some more games come on, so I got some, some stressing to do. <laughs> hey, 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 hey. If you don't, before I get to point number three, I'm going to say this. If you don't believe that determination is important, 
you got to reread the Bible. When you determine things happen for you in the supernatural, when you determine things happen for you that shouldn't happen for your family, blessings come that, that probably wouldn't have had your name on it. You kind of took them out of the air because God's like, man, I see your determination. If you don't believe me, ask the woman with the issue of, of blood. She's been bleeding for 12 years. She was determined to get to Jesus so bad that she crawled on her feet as she was probably bleeding because they never said the blood stopped. And she touched the hem of his garment, got healed. If, if, you, if you don't believe me, uh, ask the three Hebrew boys as they was determined not to take a knee before Nebuchadnezzar. And they said, we'll stand up. We, we ain't following everybody. We ain't no copycats. And, and, and Nebuchadnezzar said, I don't care then. Y'all about to die. Turn, turn the furnace up, dog. Make it hot like Nelly. Turn it, it's hot in here. Make it hot. Watch this. They throw them in there. The people who threw them in there were so hot, they died. And they're in there having a, 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 a sauna party. Oh, it's hot in here. And Jesus is in there with them saying, yeah, it is hot, but y'all won't get burned. Because when you're determined to serve God, you can be in the fire, but you're not getting burned. And you know what? You don't come out smelling like smoke either. When you're determined, God starts to do stuff for you. Oh, you don't believe me? Ask this woman whose child was sick, needed healing. And she went to Jesus. She went to the right source. She went to Jesus. And she's like, yo, Jesus, heal my people. And Jesus was like, man, I ain't coming here for the dogs. I came here for Israel. That had to be really, I, to me to see that, I'm like, Jesus, come on, dog. That's not how you be able to be acting. I would have freaked out. Like, Jesus, you could have just said no, dog. Like, like what, what's going on? Here? Time out. It was like, and Trey messed up the Bible. That's what it that said. And Jesus says, no, I don't, I don't give blessings to y'all. I'm, not, I'm, here for the, I'm here for the Jews, man. That's my first assignment. He, and he's right because that was his assignment. And she says this. She says, but even dogs can eat from the, the crumbs of the master's table. And Jesus looked back at her and said, oh, you determined to get this blessing. you determined to get healed. you determined to see this happen, and it's happened because of you. Your family needs you to be determined and get to the feet of Jesus so that life change can happen. We can't quit, church, because we don't know what our determination leads to. We don't know who needs to be healed. And point number two, three, sorry. Deliverance of our family. Our, de our determination can lead to some supernatural stuff for our family. Long story short, Naomi tells Ruth, hey, we need some food around here. She says, you going to stay with me? You're going to go work. Go to this field. We got some, our kinfolk are there. They're going to let you pick some grain. Just pick up whatever they drop on the ground. Naomi didn't say, no, I don't want to do it. Naomi went. And not only did Naomi go, she worked. So much so that when Boaz comes, he's like, yo, who's that girl over there? He, you know, he's he, he creeping on her a little bit. And then, then the dude who watches the field says, oh, that's Naomi. He ended this, ended this. And he's like, he, the first thing he says is she works hard. She takes little breaks. Some of us are already feeling guilty because we be on break. <laughs> 15 to 20 minutes, we work from home and be on break. <laughs> he says she don't take a lot of breaks. She work hard. You know what Boaz says? Leave a little extra for her then. Eventually, Naomi gets wind of this. Naomi got a little old lady wisdom. She said, oh, he did that for you? Do this. A strange thing happened. He's sleeping in his field. Why he's sleeping in the field? It still baffles me a little bit. And Naomi sits at his, I mean, uh, Ruth sits at his feet. When he awakes, he's startled. He's scared. You can tell, oh. And he's like, oh, snap. And he sees the opportunity, and he sees Ruth a little bit differently even then. And so much so, then he says, you know what, I got a plan for you. I got a plan to change things. But I never knew this part of the story as a kid. They never, like, they skipped the good stuff. Boaz was not the first in line to marry her. It was another guy. And when a guy heard how much land Naomi had with no kin, no man, he was like, oh, yeah, I want the land. I want the land. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I want to give me the land. And Boaz was like, oh, well, yeah, you can get it. The land can be yours, but you got to marry Ruth. She's a Moabite. He knew, he knew what he was doing. And because it was this weird relationship with the Jews. They didn't really like other people who weren't Jews. And he's like, oh, no, no, I don't want to land in. If I got to marry her, I ain't doing it. Boaz says, no problem. I'm next in line. Mine. <laughs> Boaz didn't care about the land. He cared about being her kinsman redeemer. And renewing, right about this, renewing their name back to good status, not identifying with the devastation, but identifying with the deliverance. Ruth's book is about deliverance in the midst of devastation. Oh, 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 okay, 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 this is crazy. We know that as believers, 
that we've been redeemed by who? Jesus. You always know the church answers. It's always Jesus. Who part of the Red Sea? Jesus. You're technically correct, okay? Like, like some technicalities. But you've been redeemed. Boaz redeemed. Ruth, we've been redeemed. Bought. Boaz bought the land, kind of bought the rights to Ruth. We've been bought with his blood. We've been redeemed. I can see how God is using a regular woman's story of devastation and heartbreak and says, no, I don't want to leave even Ruth there. I want to do something greater. Who can you help lead with your determination to deliverance? Who can you help be better tomorrow? Who can you say, hey, I see how it's starting for you, but it won't have to end there. Hey, I would never forget my time as a count counselor. Man, taking those kids, fifth grade and under the swimming pool, it was stressful. It was really, really stressful. <laughs> Olympic-sized pool. They had like a little side for the kids, like five feet and under. That's where most of us still hang to this day. We can't swim. But we had every year they would have this thing in the beginning of the year where they do a swim test. And all the little kids, fifth grade and under, I can swim, I learn. And I always look at them like, uh. Some of the kids I can tell. You know, they get up there, they put the goggles on. They do, they do the right stuff. Like, oh, yeah, that kid has some lessons. They're good. They're good. They're good. This one kid, I, heard, I asked him a couple of questions, and the way he was answering the questions, I knew he didn't know how to swim. But he said, I don't know, I know Mr. T, Mr. T, I know how to, ah, that's what they call me. Mr. T, Mr. T, I know how to swim. I'm telling you, I learn. I said, what about this? No, I don't need all that, man, I learn. It's about third grade. I'm like, oh. So I'm watching him. And the lifeguard, you know, lifeguard's like 16, 17 years old. I know at this point, like, I'm probably the one to save them, right? Like, I know. And I get real close to the edge because I know I'm, I'm, I'm about to save this kid. I, I, I knew in my heart. Because the last thing you want to do is be on the news about drowning, and then you, and then you be in the background like this. <laughs> and, you, you know, your camp director's like, you're fired, you're fired. And I'm being like, oh, man. <clears throat> so what happened? The kid goes, and he dies, and he, he's swimming. I'm like, oh, maybe he do know how to swim. The problem was not as necessary as swimming. He didn't have the endurance. And midway, and I hit it. I mean, I was, bloom. And I hear the lifeguard blow the whistle, but I'm already in the water. I'm like, bro, you're late. And I grabbed the kid, swimming because it's 12 feet. It's kind of close. I get to the six feet. I said, get on my back. Put him on my back, swimming to the five feet. And y'all know, what, you, what do you think your reaction would have been if you, you were near death and you're about to drown? He, no, he didn't. They're third grade. He didn't say thank you. All right. He didn't, thank you, thank you, Mr. Trey. You're awesome. Thank you for saving my life. Now I can have a future. No, nope, it wasn't. It was not that. He said this. He said, "Hey, I, I, I could. How you? How could you tell I was about to drown?" I said, "Bro, I knew immediately. I, said, I knew immediately." But he said, "But I could. But I could do it." It wasn't, the water wasn't that deep. I told him this. I don't care how deep the water is. My job is to keep you safe so that you don't drown. And for some of us in this room, you've been looking at how deep the water is. And God is like, you can drown in five feet. God is not going to leave you there struggling. He doesn't care how deep the water is. His job is to make sure you don't drown. So watch this. Some of y'all are like, I've been drowning for a long time. If you can say that, you're, not, you're, you're okay. It takes a minute. But God is not going to let you drown. He's not going to allow your guilt to overwhelm you. He's going to deliver you. He's not going to allow your depression to overwhelm you. He's going to deliver you. If you just give him some time. Many of us, I, I, I can't do this anymore. Yes, you can. Just keep swimming. Just keep shooting. He's going to deliver you. He's not going to leave you to drown. Stand with me, church. Many of us, we've been asking this, this same question. God, how long is it going to take you to deliver me? Some of us are still in the midst right now. We need some deliverance. But I got to ask you this, this question, church. Are you tired of fighting? Aren't you tired of swinging and missing? And God keeps looking at you like, you want me to jump in yet? My 
prayer, uh, prayer team, come on up. We're going to pray for these folks. I don't care if things are going good and great for your life. I always get prayer. Because if anything, God, can we just keep it right here for a second? Don't let it dip. Watch this. Come get prayer. Why? Because I know I need some deliverance. Watch this. Not for something I probably did, but it's some stuff way back that's tied to my family name. Some generational curses that God says, I need somebody to be determined like Ruth. Work hard and break it. Can I tell you this victory story for Ruth? Y'all know Ruth is Jesus' great, 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 great grandmother. A Moabite. And I was like, wow, Ruth went from widowed, homeless, couldn't do nothing. To the great, great grandmother, watch this, of David, great grandmother of David and Jesus. We're talking about deliverance. We're still talking about her to this day. And watch this. And she wasn't chasing fame. She just wanted to be loyal to Naomi. Stop chasing fame. Just be loyal to Jesus. Stop chasing a job. Just be loyal to Jesus. Stop. He's going to make your name great. And we're going to be talking about you. Well, maybe not me, but our kids, kids, kids. Be talking about you. Well, my grandma, she was a prayer warrior. My grandfather, he was a prayer warrior. He taught me how to pray. He taught me how to keep swimming. He taught me how to keep going. But it starts with your choice today.